Welcome to Anything But Ordinary with your host, Spooky and Raven. Tonight we're going to talk about one of my direct ancestors, the infamous land pirate, John A. Merle. I, my name is Spooky, and here is your other host, Raven. Hey, how are you tonight? I'm doing good. I'll be doing even better if the storms quit. Oh, yeah. It's been raining off and on up here, too. <coughs> we had some pretty wicked storms I had to drive back from up we north. Had, yeah, I'm glad you made it safe. I kind of wondered about that until I heard from you. Uh, we've been having a few storms here, but um, they've been short ones, but we've had several go through. Uh, tonight, we are going to talk about the infamous land pirate, John Andrews Merle. He is a direct ancestor of mine. I, I have a direct blood link to this guy. He, um, first, um, I'm going to tell you how he's related to me. John's well, you wanna, brother... You don't, you want to give him a little brief description of who he is first? I mean... Uh, John Merle was a ruthless land pirate that roamed the, uh, Colum uh, the Cumberland, Natchez, and Mississippi rivers. Once in a while, he would uh, be over by the Columbia River, but he spent a lot of his time, probably most of his time, along the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. he, um, he robbed people. He killed people. He just, he just was not a nice man. <laughs> and so... You kind of got interested in this person because you found out through a, a what? How did you find out that he was related to or whatnot? Well, his brother, William, was my paternal grandmother's great-grandfather. And her maiden name is Merle. It's a direct link to this guy. Well, at least to his brother, but... Uh, uh, Close enough. Close enough. Thank you. I'm getting tongue-tied. Uh, when my grandmother's father died, she thought, of, of her life, she knew him as Harvey. She thought her dad's name was Harvey. When he died, she found out that his real name was William, and he was wanted by the law. Well, this kind of um, piqued her, tweaked her interest a little bit. So about, mm, I guess it was about 20 years later or more, at least 20, she started to trace her family tree. And when she got to William S. Merle, that took her to John A. Merle. And when she found out what he was, it embarrassed her so bad that she quit tracing her family tree. She just quit. She, um, and I mean, she had quite a bit of information gathered before she just stopped. And she refused to talk about it. She refused to even acknowledge him. And I mean, this was the brother of her great grandfather. And and her great and her great grandfather was no angel either. He was a petty thief. He was he was a horse thief. I mean, you know, it, lawlessness just seemed to have run in the family. Her her grandfather was wanted by the law. I'm not too sure about her father. Uh, she didn't speak to him much, but it just it just embarrassed her so bad she just quit tracing her family tree. And I thought that was a shame because personally, I think it's funny. Funny, ha ha, or funny. I I, neat. I think funny, ha ha, funny, neat. Because I mean, this guy was famous in his day. It doesn't matter what he did. Well, or not what he, yeah, not neat that you you are for murders and killers and all that stuff. Oh but no, I'm not. But still, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting to have some well-known person. Yeah, because like this guy was famous in his day. He, like I said, he wasn't a nice guy. I don't condone what he did. I don't condone crime of any kind. Okay. Well, they say that he. No one person, no one man, actually, in American history achieved more than John A. Merle did as far as in terms of organizing crime before the 20th century. This so guy he was hugely had, known all over. This guy had a, his gang was called the Klan, and he had a gang network that some people said was as many as 2,500 people. Yeah. So if not I'm, more. No, I mean, who really yeah, knows? Well, he, he worked in some, you know, he did his business in something like seven states. So yeah. he had to have a network in each one of those states to do what he did. Business is a nice way to put it, but yeah. <laughs> well, that's how he made his living, what can I say? 
But uh, like I said, you know, I don't condone crime of any kind, but I just thought it was neat that somebody as famous as this man. I mean, there's been books written about him. There, he has been portrayed in um, early TV shows. Uh, uh, Mark Twain mentions him in uh, his autobiography, Life on the Mississippi, not to mention Mark Twain kind of pays tribute to him in his novel, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Right. As uh, with those ca- the caves with Injun Joe and yeah, who's in the looking cave for the money or something. In the cave with Injun Joe. In the movie, it was Tom and Becky that were in the cave, but in the book, it was Tom and Huckleberry Finn. But they spot they found Injun Joe just as he found Merle's treasure. And then, when, of course, when Injun Joe um, when, when the posse or the law was after Injun Joe, he ran into those caves and he got lost and he starved to death. And then it tells again about John and or Tom and Huck going back into the cave and refinding Merle's treasure. This was Mark Twain's little tribute to John Merle. Now, the photo I got up that you gave me, now this is the only known photo of John A. Merle, but the only reason why you have it is because he's a family member, but nobody out there, you can't really find any photos, but there's copies of there's copies, copies of, of this one. Yeah, but you guys not, have the original. Right. But there are... There's cut, but the, the, as far as anybody knows, there's only been one photo taken of him, which I find interesting because his mother came from a wealthy family, and she could have very well have, well, her family could have very well have afforded the 10 cents, which was a lot of money back then. Uh, 10 cents would buy you almost a week's worth of groceries. I'm just laughing because in my head, I'm like, well, I was thinking about what you were saying, and I thought, well, back then, you know, people didn't really think about taking photographs of themselves. They well, didn't really care about then, it. But nowadays, I mean, this is going to be known as the generate. This generation is going to be known as you know people who are obsessed with taking photos. Well, and this videos. is going to be this. This generation is going to be known as the selfies. Yeah, insanely. Yeah. Self- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> selfies. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, there's you can see such a difference back then where people didn't really care, and now people are just obsessed with you know, taking pictures of themselves in the bathroom. But, yeah, go on. But I could see why Uh, they don't have photos. Somebody wants to know what the black spot is on the photo, and this is actually a copy. But the original photo is on what they call a DAC. It's a glass. It's a picture on glass, and they didn't really keep very well. No, because it's on glass, so it could get scraped or rubbed off. Yeah, it could get scraped or rubbed off, you know, or whatever. So it's, you know, and a photo that old is not going to be in really, really great shape. But... I um, I find it interesting. So you heard it as a kid about this guy. Then you decided, I'm going to start researching who this person is and... You know, why people I, don't I want to my, talk about them, huh? I talked my Aunt Linda into giving me all of the information that my grandmother had gathered. And there was information from all over. And I thought, wow, this guy really jumped around a lot. Well, you know, and I found out as I was researching, like I said, he conducted his business in about seven states. And he had quite a network of, of gang members. His gang was known as the Klan. And after a while, people were referring to it as the magical clan because it was hard to catch these people. Right, because they were so You know, it was like they just, you'd get on the trail of one, it was almost like, poof, they disappear. But um, John Andrews Merle was born in Williamson County, Tennessee in 1806. Now, there are some people out there that say that it was 1804, but according to family sources, it was 1806. His father was Jeffrey Merle, who was a Revolutionary War veteran. He was born in 1738, and after the war, he actually owned a tavern for a while, and he bought land in Williamson County, uh, Tennessee, and being a religious man, he became a Methodist minister who wasn't home very much. But back then, and they still do it, some places still do it today, they had what they called a, uh, depending on what denomination you were, he was on the Methodist preacher circuit, which meant that he would travel to different churches that he was told to go to. 
Well, so, they still, like, they do that up north, you know. Yeah. In the small town that we have land at and stuff, that this one priest, it, for a Catholic-type church or whatever, that I don't know, but I'm sure it happens with the Lutherans up there, too. He travels from multiple small towns, and he has a wide area to cover, you know, because they don't right. have a lot of, you know, priests well, and stuff <clears throat> to cover the small towns up there. So, yeah, they still do that to today. They just don't have the well, back then, troubles that they did then. Yeah. But back then, the mode of transportation wasn't so fast. You know, that he was either on a horse, he had a buggy being pulled by a horse, or he walked. Right. And some of these congregations would be lucky if they had a real preacher giving the sermon once every two months. So traveling around then wasn't as easy as it is now. Well, yeah, I could see that why he was gone on, all the time. Yeah, I could that see also why he was depends on where your time. churches are that you're going to. Right. Well, that's he, why his dad was gone all the time. If he's a traveling preacher, you know, right. it leaves the wife and the kids home alone for a well, long they were, time. Well, they were lucky if they saw him once every couple months. Psh. You know, so, I mean, that's just the way it was. Preachers were preachers and they, back then, and they traveled. Very few of them were lucky enough to be, have one church that they preached in every Sunday. And back then, they only went to church Sunday morning. There was no night church, you know, no Sunday night, no Wednesday night church. It was, you know, Sunday morning. I wonder if everybody always had it on Sunday. I mean, maybe depending on when they get there, you know, but that's getting off track anyway. But, yeah, I can see why well, that father was gone a long time because he's a preacher making his way around. So it left the mom to, you know, basically ro raise how many kids did you say? Uh, there were eight kids. Um, he was 56 years old when he married the first time, and he married. Um, this is John's dad. This is John's dad, Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. uh he was 56 when he married, and he married Zalifia, Z-I-L-I-P-H-I-A, Andrews, and she was 30-plus years younger than him. And, you know, tell you the truth, he was 56 years old with a, with a young wife. They had eight kids. Yeah. So he was home once in a while. He was home at least eight times. Yeah, well... Or somebody was. <laughs> somebody was. Right. We'll get into that here in a minute. Right. Okay. Um, Zalifia Andrews. <clears throat> excuse me. I'm having problems with my throat tonight. Uh, Zalifia Andrews. She came. She was born in 1763. She came from a well-to-do, upstanding, respected person, uh, family in her community. She did not grow up poor. I mean, you know, back then, she um, she had anything a girl could want. Of course, they don't have as much back then as they have now, but, well, I mean, her family was considered wealthy. Right. I don't really know what her parents did, but... Because um, you haven't found that part yet I, it, it's and kind you're of, researching? Yeah. Exactly, you know, I mean, trying to find anything on her parents, because somebody that's wealthy, you know, was somebody that was well-known in the community, um, maybe he owned a business, you know, or something, he had to do something, it couldn't have just been a plantation, in my opinion, but anyway, her father, when, when he passed away, he left her an inn near Columbia, Tennessee, by the, near the, Clum the Cumberland River, mm -hmm. also getting tongue-tied. And the family moved there, and I can't, I never did understand why the family moved to this inn because Jeffrey owned 146 acres, which was a lot of land back then. Right. But they, uh, the family moved to this inn near uh, Columbia, Tennessee. And the interesting thing about it was this fine, upstanding, proper lady became a prostitute after she married this preacher. Right. I was going to say, I when I was kind of reading up a little bit after you talked to me about this and you were wanting to do a show on it, I mean, I read that she was basically, a, <laughs> and not to be vulgar, but she was a, a whore, you know, and right. that in went from whatever it used to be into basically like a combination slash well, when, tavern between right when she got this place it, when she stuff. got this place it was a respectable place you know it was 
in a good spot for travelers back then. You know, we're talking uh, the 1820s. Uh-huh. Uh, back then, you know, it, to go 10 miles took an entire day. Right. So it's... this was a this was a place along the Cumberland, and at that time there was a, there was traffic along the Cumberland River, and um, it, she so they had a nice respectable place to spend the night, but she turned it into a bordello. Yeah, I mean they said it was like a, a, a like from what I was reading about it, it turned it was like a tavern and then a brothel of thieves, right? You know, for a, like a market where everybody just came in there and stuff, but you know for her to keep means and money and which is kind of weird because she came from a rich family. It's kind of and all of, this she hid, all of this she hid from her husband for a while until he finally found out. I don't know. It doesn't say if he found out about her becoming a prostitute. But it found, uh, she taught her kids to steal. Right. What she, what she would do is when her clients or her guests were sleeping in their rooms at night, she would send her children into these rooms to steal anything of value, and then she hid all of this from her husband. Eventually, he would find out some of what was going on, and he would beg her to stop, and she never did. Well, yeah, I guess she, her and her kids and other people that she had worked for, they basically would wear the men out and have them yeah. partied up a lot, where they'd just be knocked out, where <laughs> then she'd send in all the different kids to steal, and it was John, I read about, it was John Amaral who we're talking about tonight, relative... <laughs> And his brother, who did most of the thieving and stuff for her. Right. It, w it was mostly John and William who did who did the stealing. Which the is, other it's kids. so weird because she's married to a preacher, and then you know the preacher's wife's you know the capital W. I know. I, she wasn't a typical cre preacher's wife. That's for sure. You know, back I hope then. Not, but yeah. <laughs> back then, if you were a preacher's wife, you had prestige. You know, you had, as long as you behaved yourself, I guess, and watched what you did in public, you had an untarnished reputation. It makes you wonder. You know, this woman j just didn't seem to care. It makes you wonder, like, either how she grew up or what she had to do in order to survive while he was gone. You know, sometimes back then that was the only way for a woman to make money. You know, not that I'm promoting it or, you know, saying anything. Sometimes people still do that to this day to try to make ends meet, you know, but. Right. You know, she had, what, eight kids, and this dude's running off throughout the whole country preaching, and he's definitely not you know sending money home. And you know he wasn't getting that much money, well, you know. He probably I mean, didn't get money. He probably got paid food and something, you know, just to take care of him where he was at. Nothing. When he, no. and, yeah, and he stayed in uh, members of that church, you know. Somebody would invite him to dinner, invite him to spend the night, whatever. So basically, you know... Uh, uh, for the most part, he was getting free room and board and a meal. Mm -hmm. But there were times when he had to stop, you know, and buy his own meal, I'm sure. But preachers still did not make that much money. You know, I mean, if you threw a penny in the collection plate, that was considered a lot of money. So basically, if you think about it, John and his siblings grew up with a band of, you know, a bunch of different thieves and probably learned a lot of different, <laughs> you know, trades and Oh, I'm sure they did because the people that came and stayed at that inn were not proper, respectable people. And I, I mean, suppose, they may have been in the beginning, but it sure didn't end up that way. Right, and I su suppose being um, subjected to your mother's certain lifestyle and seeing the way that she behaves and being with all these different people and seeing such corruption and no morals, I mean, that's got to really jack with you or your head back then. I can't very well... Yeah, I could kind of see where he went down that avenue. I mean, he was no. grew up in it. I mean, he hung out well, with thieves. I don't know murderers. how long Jeffrey Merle stayed on the circuit because he was in his 80s when he died in 1824. And his wife wasn't really that far up in age, I don't think. I never really added it up when she died in 1838. Well, depending on how... I mean, back then you could die at any age, really, if you think about it. So. Yeah, but a lot of times, though, the average age back then was forty years old. Mm -hmm. You know, when you if you lived to be forty, you were considered an old person. Guess what? I know that's funny, old. but I'm <laughs> like, we're all be pushing old soon enough. Then no, but I I find it interesting. You know, she comes from this rich family, and then she turns to that. But I could see why he turned to crime. Well, maybe the inn was the only thing that her father left her because she had brothers. 
she wasn't an only child. She had brothers, and back then, the bro you know, uh, men inherited the estates. Women couldn't even vote. And I don't know when, uh, I know there was a time back then that women couldn't even own property. Well, unless they inherited it. Unless they inherited it, but, but maybe that's why she got married. Very to that few women inherited property. Maybe back she, that's why she got married to that man, in order to get that property from her family. Could have been, and like I said, uh, Jeffrey had 146 acres, which probably went to his brother because his 146 acres was right next to his brother's acreage. So his brother could have got that. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Right. So he basically it, lived with his mom until he was, what, 16, you were saying? Well, he didn't know his dad very well, and he didn't respect him. And um, John was the third child of eight children. And I think between William and John, there was a girl. Oh, I can't think of her name off the top of my head. I used to know who all the children I were. I thought you said it started with the E or something, or... No, that was, she's younger than that. There was a sister that was born, and uh, Jenna, she was um, born in 1770, and she died in 1779. William was born in 1792, and he lived to 1867, so he, lived, he was around during the Civil War time. Mm-hmm. And then John was uh, born in 1806, and he died in 1844. And then there were other brothers that they're not sure. The only one that they're sure about was Leanna, 1809 to 1825. Right. But there were three of them, Jeffrey, Judetta, and Mary Elizabeth. Her, her, her name was Mary Elizabeth, but they called her Bessie. And the reason I bring her up is because she married an outlaw, and he was famous in his area. His name was Robert Duvall. Yeah. So, and I was telling Raven this, in northeast Arkansas, there is a bluff there referred to as Duvall's Bluff. And the reason it's called that is because the town people finally got sick and tired of this guy. And they cornered him up on this bluff, and they skinned him alive. And to this day, it's referred to as Duvall's Bluff. She was born in 1802, so she was actually older than um, than John. Mm -hmm. so, but like I'm saying, you don't really know. I mean, if the preacher's <coughs> gone that much, and she's got all these eight kids. I mean, and she had that in to, in to keep me ends meet. You don't really know who's kids who really well that's true that's that is actually that that is true um but at 16 well you know you went through the kids but didn't you i thought you were saying something earlier and then, and then you changed it to something else but you said at 16 he left or right something um uh, i think he was what around 16 maybe younger when his mother died i'm not sure uh, she died in 1838. No, she, he was in prison when she died. So he wasn't around when when she died. Um, like I said, he didn't know his dad very well, and he really didn't respect him. But he did manage to learn the Bible. Or some of it. Uh, some of it. That was one of his scams. <laughs> Matter of fact, it was one he started out with. He used to disguise himself as a preacher, and he would go around to these churches, kind of like the evangelist of the day. And they said that he could preach a sermon that would just absolutely grab your attention. Uh, you just wouldn't, couldn't take your eyes off of him. He had that much charisma. But while he was in there preaching these sermons, his gang was outside stealing the horses. Right. I read those. Good horses. And every time, and everybody agreed to this, to all the stories down through, his horse somehow, he, he rode a really great horse. And for some reason... Nobody bandits kept overlooking this horse. His horse was never stolen. Well, they probably knew it was his horse, and they didn't well, they dare mess with his him because he had a band of well-organized criminals throughout several oh, states. Yeah. I mean, they probably knew don't mess with John A. Merle. You know, but you would think though that they would take his horse and maybe take it away a little bit 
what where he could still get on it to kind of because don't that looks really strange that he's got the best horse out there and it's one of the few that isn't stolen. I'm sure I, there there was probably a marking on his saddle or everybody knew, hey, this is his horse. I'm sure there was something that everybody already knew way ahead of time so people know not to jack with that horse. But I mean, so he basically started what preaching in 1825. Then you're saying ish when he was um because he. Well, he can't be preaching when he's 16, because who's going to listen to a 16-year-old preacher, you know? He had I to have done know. other things I don't know what bit, year he started preaching. I don't even know what year he really, really started his major uh, business of crime, when his crime wave began. I'm really not sure. I think that uh, he really started uh, really committing his crimes and stuff probably around between 18 and 20 years old. Right. And well, he was born it, what 1806. He said he was born in 1806. So basically, in 1825, he'd be, you know, in his 20s. So yeah, and that would make sense. Then he would be because I was reading that there, he was preaching around that time and was establishing and organizing his big, large group of outlaws. You know, right? But he had to have been a char, you know, charismatic. And, and very charming man in order to to manipulate well mark twain a lot said, of people mark twain said he had to have a golden tongue i'm telling you what to get that many people to band with him throughout so many different states and then to get everybody in the church and the, and, and to listen to him oh yeah but you hours. know people didn't when somebody came up that was a preacher they didn't question that they really didn't question that. Um, it, it just, it preachers for one thing, preachers were hard to come by back then, right? Because they were on, like I said before, they were on this circuit, and um, but to get everybody in town practically to go in and listen to I him know. preach, because there'd still be some town folks out that didn't. Not everybody went to church. No offense to church going people. I mean, I'm just saying some people aren't into churches and have different belief well, there, systems. There were a too. few, but the majority of the town would, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so the ones that didn't, would the he... majority of the town would go to church. Mark Twain said, and Mark Twain <clears throat> and John Merle had met each other along the Mississippi several times. This was not somebody Mark Twain didn't know. Mark Twain actually interacted with this guy. What was Mark Twain's real name again? Uh, Samuel Clemens. That's right. Um, he said, uh, when, he's talking about John Merle, when he traveled uh, as his usual disguise was that of an uh, uh, itinerant preacher, and it is said that his, his discourses, I can't believe I'm getting tongue-tied, sorry about that, were very soul-moving, interesting to uh, the hearers so much that they forgot to look after their horses which were carried away by his confederates while he was preaching. This was this was what he started out doing. And, I mean, he knew about these things because his father was a preacher. So he knew something about the business. Right. Your voice dropped out for a second there, but it's still, I don't know if your bars went red or whatever, but you might want to keep an eye on your bars there. Um, I was thinking he must, I mean, people must have waited out outside of town because, you know, if a bunch of people just come roaming into town, people would become, you know, auspicious. So they had to have been really right. skilled and quiet in order to. I would imagine sneak that they off all these animals. Yeah. And, I would imagine they kind of drifted in, you know, one or two at a time. And then pretty soon along the way. You know, here comes this preacher, and everybody embraces this preacher, I don't, not knowing what he is. But right, but even when nowadays, when one person new comes to a small town, everybody is like, "Who is that?" So yeah. if more than one or two people started showing up in a, a, a short time period, people would start to wonder why are all these people showing up. So I'm thinking they probably didn't really go into town. I think they just hung out and waited in a that's way where in, they wouldn't be found, possible. you know, in caves or. Well, it would make sense, or... too. You can't have, you know, you can't go into town just dressed as a preacher and take your gang with you. I It makes sense that they would have hidden out somewhere. Right. You know, maybe a couple of them drifted into town, but it, 
it would be kind of silly to take your whole gang in there. I mean, this man had a lot of people that he did business with and that rode with him. Well, he going from state to state, he was clearly like a politician, a preacher, you know, golden tongue, charismatic <laughs> man in order to talk these people into a life of crimes and even running into thieves. I mean, he had to have been very skilled. And I think he must have picked that up from his days working in the inn with his mom and that whole place being a broth of, of thieves, you know. So he clearly had to have picked up a lot of things, even just by listening, well, at, you know, at one and time, not engaging with people. But yeah. he had to have, I mean, he's. I'm surprised he didn't run for president. Well, the people that he hung out with at one time, he in uh, there was a time when him, Frank James, and John Wesley Harden all hung out. Now John Wesley Harden had a reputation of being a badass, and according to some stories, he shot a man just for snoring. Frank James, he um, he wandered around a little bit before before the Civil War. And the the one thing that there, there's one thing that all three of these people have in common: they were all sons of preachers. I guess they really have been rebelled. I'm sure there was a time it, that I read that there was one time when John Wesley Harden uh, tried to make a living as a false preacher, but he just didn't have it in him. He was too mean. Didn't, yeah, didn't have the knack to persuade people. He didn't people. have the knack. Where John Merle, some people though had had the, had the charisma and had the knowledge. Well, some enough knowledge anyway. He probably would read a couple passages and then. You know, do the hellfire and, you know, really and get I'm sure it going. His dad, you know? Yeah. And I'm sure his dad, you know, spouted off Bible verses around the house and stuff when he was home, but his dad just wasn't home that much. But he had to pick it up somewhere. Right. I'm sure back then not everybody had a Bible, so they didn't know all the Bible, but they knew, like, the famous parts that people would love to talk about, like Revelation and. Genesis or this or that, yeah. just certain parts. So if you knew just certain amount enough, then they would be like, oh, yeah, this guy is so-and-so because they well, would know more than they did because not everybody had a Bible, just the pastor or True. priest or whoever came through. And and back then, too, preachers didn't preach like they do today. Back then it was hellfire, and if you don't stop your sins, you're going to burn in hell and all this other I stuff. I think there's know? some churches that still do that, though. Well, there are, but, I mean, that was mainly what... what um, a lot of churches preach. They didn't preach about love and, and and love for humanity and love your fellow man and all this other stuff. Well, some churches and used fear in order to get That's true. What they, they would wanted use fear to get to money get you, and power yeah. and you know, manipulate exactly. people. But that's a different exactly. that's a different and, show. And also disguising himself as a preacher, it made it easier for him to move around undetected. Or, and they wouldn't suspect him. That is him. until somebody caught on, but... Well, yeah, I'm sure somebody did eventually, but, you know, they wouldn't suspect this guy because he's, you know, going from state to state, little town, little town, so clearly they're like, oh, this guy's a great preacher or whatever, so that word of mouth with him would go around, but, you know, uh, <laughs> how would these other people know, you know, what would he just go to the preach one night, go hang out in the bar the next night and say, hey, come be my, you know, be my gang? What the I heck don't was know his how gang they called I don't anyway. know how they recruited. There, his gang was called the Clan, because there were so many of them. And after a while, somebody nicknamed it the Magical Clan because every time that they would, they would get close to capturing any of them, it was like poof, they would disappear. So they started calling, it, well, it's Magical Clan. But um, a lot of his crimes were. He spent a lot of time. And committed a lot of crimes, though, moving along the rivers, the Cl the, Cum the Cumberland, the Columbia, the Natchez, and the Mississippi rivers, and that's how he got the name the land the the Great Land Pirate. Right. Well, there's so, a lot of people who were fearful of this. I mean, because wasn't he just like a? I mean, they murdered and they stole and I mean, they murdered, they, they robbed, they stole. Reading. You know, it was anything that they could do to get money. They didn't care. John Merle was probably the most ruthless outlaw to ever roam the South. Even Mark Twain said one time that uh, when it comes to the outlaw business, uh, Jesse and Frank James are the retailers, but John Merle was the wholesaler. Right. I mean, he was big he, time. 
he was just he was a ruthless man he he you know it's like i said before he just was not a nice man at all uh and he didn't care i don't personally from what i've found out about him i don't even think he had a conscience he wanted what he wanted he took it it was easier for him i don't know if he thought it was a game because i want to tell you this man worked um, a long time right so, someone had a question in uh um a southern outlaw with a gang called the clan was that the clan with the c or a clan with the k it it's clan with the c penny yeah not the not the other one not this the was white C-L-A-N. you know not the white as a matter of fact, he the, was he was the, the freeing Ku slaves. The Ku Klux Klan didn't come in until later. They right. came in after the Civil War. But John Earl Merle, wasn't he like upsetting everybody because he got into the point where he was like stealing slaves? Okay, that was another business he had. I mean, because she the um, question kind of came up, so I thought just uh, that's why he wasn't in the KKK. He was the opposite. He was ups, you know upsetting people who had slaves actually. Well, John Merle, um, I was going to say, he operated in seven or eight states. Oh, yeah, he considered ahead. Madison City, Tennessee his home. John Merle did have a wife and child, but I have not really been able to find anything on them. You know, it was, of course, he was never home. I'm imagining that uh, maybe he sent money home, but he wasn't there to raise his kid. Um, he made a lot of money as a fake preacher, but most of his money was From made looting. robbing and stealing slaves. Yeah, looting and stuff. This was one of his businesses. Raven laughs when I call this a business, but I really don't know what else to call well, it. Well, I, I laugh because I said that's the nice way to put it, a business, quote unquote. It's like being a mobster, you know, it's my business, but it's really, mm-hmm. you know... Yeah, I'm only shooting you because it's strictly business, nothing personal. Yeah. Uh, he would get these slaves to, to work for him. What he would do is he would promise them money. He'd tell them, and he would come right out and tell them that he was planning on to sell them three or four times, then split the money, and um, then let them uh, escape to freedom in the north. Well, the slaves would go for this, Mm -hmm. okay? So what he would do is he would sell this slave. That night, the slave would run away, or he would go in and steal the slave, and then they'd go off somewhere else, and then he would sell the slave. The slave would come back that night, and he did this three or four times. He couldn't really do it any more than that because after a while... The slave becomes known, and once the slave runs away, they start looking for him. Right. And uh, w- But when the slave became too well known after having been um, resold and restolen several times, too many advertisements appeared in the papers, so Merle would select some quiet spot on a lonely road and kill the slave. That sucks. He not only killed these slaves, he deboweled them, deboweled them. In other words, he would split them open. Yep. And he would fill them full of rocks, and he would drop them in a creek or in a river. And one of the things that made him so successful was his thoroughness at destroying condemning evidence. There's only been one slave that escaped from him. And I'm not, we're, we're not really sure if John just let him go or if he just took off on, it, on his own. But <laughs> his name was Moses. And when Moses got to the north where he was free, he needed a last name. So he just took the last name Merle. Now, that wasn't too unusual back then because freed slaves, uh, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, the, um, they would take the name of the last name of their owner, their previous owner. I hate to say owner because that to me that's offensive, but that's just well, the way it was. Yeah, yeah, we're not. Um, yeah, we're not trying to. I'm not trying to offend anybody. Yeah, but that's we're just trying to explain it. history a little bit of who she found out of the history of this. <laughs> but God. Moses somehow made it out alive. 
-hmm. So, and this was another thing that embarrassed my grandmother to no end, was when she found out that there was this ex-slave in her family tree. Personally, I didn't care. Well, why would you? It's just another but, person. Well, yeah. It's just another person. He didn't pick how he was born and what he got exactly. forced into. You and know? this was another reason she quit tracing the family roots. And it was... Maybe um, she should just stop leaving her house then. <laughs> just... Well, at one point, really. At, I, I don't even want to get started about that woman. But um, at one time, descendants of Moses Merle tried to contact the Merle family around here and they fully rejected them and wouldn't even speak to them. And I thought that was a shame. When I found that out, I couldn't believe that they had done that because if I had known about it at the time, I would have invited them in for dinner. Right. Because I would have been, I would have just wanted to know the history. Of what they found out. Uh, yeah, of what they found out. I would want to know because they had to have traced their family tree all the way up to, to find the the murals around here right all the way up to that point <coughs> uh, t and, and finding out that he had probably had been a part with john a merle you know and that now they were just trying to put the pieces together only to Could have been. be shunned but i can see why family members would not want to talk about this or have any dealings with it because i mean john a merle isn't such a great guy to want to openly to talk about I, I you know I wouldn't I, I wouldn't take him out to meet my friends well I don't think you would even hang out with them to be honest I, with you. I, he, he's somebody I would not have even hang hung out with even though he is family I would have never hung out with him but it's still I still thought it was cool that somebody this famous was on the direct bloodline yeah not cool it, because he's a dirty rotten murderer right crazy it's like dude. I said I I don't I don't uh, condone any type of crime, especially the kind type of crimes that this man uh, pulled. But it, it it's still, you know, to me, kind of awesome to find somebody this famous on the bloodline, and he's not that far down it. Right. Well, I heard that basically trees all up and down the South were filled with men hung for their part in John Merle's, you know, December twenty fifth, eighteen thirty five scheme to incite like a slave revolt and take over of That's true. There the were governments a lot. of several states. Like he was what he, starting what things he, up. What he wanted to do, he wanted to start a war between slaves and owners and other white people. And, and it wasn't was, it wasn't he was for going anything to do this. righteous thing. It was just yeah. so he could start up problems and then go No, stealing. he was going to do he was going to do this in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And especially, in, he was going to start it in New Orleans. Go he loved New Louisiana Orleans. and he loved New Orleans. But yeah. um, the scheme was found out and some of the people involved in it, because he thought that this would make him governor of Louisiana. When authorities found this out, they went hunting for them and they did find quite a few members of his clan and they hung them from trees along the river. And it was like, you know, you go down the river, ride down, and you see all these men hanging from these trees. And I think they I, said something like they left them up there to show, to let people know. They, they did. They left them up there. Just left them up there. And uh, they, I don't know if they ever took them down or if they stayed up there until they completely decomposed or what happened. But they just left them up there, and they were up there for a long, long time. And they left him up there as a warning to everybody else, all the other outlaws in the area. It didn't deter Merle because he didn't care. You know, to him, men were He was were untouchable, expendable. practically, you know, yeah. He, well, he was practically untouchable. I mean, they couldn't find him. There were no pictures of him. Very few people really actually knew what he looked like. And even members in his network. There were even members in his clan that he worked with. But they never saw him. They probably that, got orders that, from other that didn't men. They didn't even know what he looked like. He could have been standing next to some of them. They would have never known it was him. <coughs> well, that's... So, and I think it's interesting that you, had, you guys had actually have a real photo from your family line of him. You know, um, but there's, like I said, when I typed it up and tried to look him up and see, there's a lot of different misinformation. 
there's false information out there, different dates, this, that, everything else. So it was kind of hard weeding through, you know, what's factual, what's not. So I found it interesting some of the things that you were telling me from what you well, found out from the Well, even in the books Sam written about stuff. him, you just see illustrations of him. Right. You don't see pictures of him. And his brother, William, nobody had a picture of him. P pictures were just, my grandmother said one time, pictures are just something we don't do. We don't think they're necessary. I, the only pictures that I had ever seen hung in that woman's house was a picture of my dad and a picture of his brother. And they were both in Marine Corps uniforms. Hmm. And she probably, you know, she, I asked her if she had any um, pictures of dad when he, was a, when he was a boy. She didn't have any. She didn't even have school pictures. So it's just, you know, I guess it's one of their little quirks. Well, it's okay. I just find it interesting, you know, uh, just how huge this guy was and how, <laughs> you know, the fact that basically before the 20th century, he was the top well-known man for organizing such huge crime sprees and everything else, you know? Well, you know, it was the same way with Jesse James, though. A lot of people didn't know what he looked like. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it's, you know, and, and like I said back then, pictures were a luxury. I'm a lot of people didn't even get pictures of their loved ones in, unless they were dead because uh, photos were included in the funeral package. Right. Well, they Otherwise, were, would have had to have paid a dime for a photograph. They say, I mean, he had stolen so much. I mean, at, at one point, I think... One somebody said that Merle's personal cash was like over a million, you know, in stolen loot. Some people say that he buried some of it. Um, well, I believe he buried it and stored it in lots of places in caves and and on on. And well, they there, had there's certain a, markings. Yeah. There's certain and I don't and I don't doubt it. Uh, there is a place near Natchez, Mississippi, called the Devil's Punch Bowl. Now. Uh, from what I found, John Merle had been in the area. There were uh, stories circulating that he buried some treasure there. There's a place in South Carolina called Merle's Inlet. And it's named after him. And supposedly, he buried treasure in there. You know, there's a lot of places where supposedly he buried um, treasure. So. Well, it's well he did, but they, they also, people knew who worked for John because they had certain trees or something like that that were planted in front of houses and stuff so people knew this guy works he's in this clan you know I don't know I'm sorry I had a coughing fit would you please say that again they said when you go through different states and certain towns certain houses would be have certain trees or certain plants in front of it then you knew that these people were a part of the clan they had that's what I read on the internet I don't know if you write it up above that, that. I, I, I never read that, but... It was about, I'm like, sure. certain beech trees, B-E-E-C-H right. well, trees, have... and other things. So people, that was their way of letting other people know we were, were part of the clan. And then they also wore, um, like, a gold pendant or a gold necklace, something like a gold coin or something around their neck. And then there was, like, some other marking that they would wear, too, that people would know they're all part of the clan, you know? Well, they would ha there were so many members of that clan that they had to know who was a member and who wasn't by some way. So that would make sense to me that they would have some sort of signal. So if another member of that clan came into a town and he saw that, he would know, okay, there's where I can go. To stay or whatever. To stay or yep. whatever, exactly. There, yeah, they had certain trees planted in it was like a number of set of trees. It was either three or four set of trees buried, or buried, da da, planted, like in a certain pattern, so that they would know and it would grow, and people would know. Okay, this is a safe house. It's got to go here, da da da. You know, and some people actually even had like the letter M, on some of their objects. You know, so people well, would know. if you think about it, it really does make sense because, like during the the days of the Underground Railroad. You know, slaves knew safe houses mm -hmm. by a certain piece of material or whatever that hung in the window or hung on the door. 
And that's how they knew that they could go up to that house. They would be safe. Those people would help them get to the next so-called station. I just, so it, it amazes it, me that he had such gift of, you know, charisma and, you know, NLP, I'll call, you know, ne- neuralistic, linguistic, you know, programming, be able to communicate to these people and talk them into joining his clan. I mean, he must have offered them, you can only have like a certain percentage. I mean, he must have gave them some kind of good percentage for I them to join with him. I wonder how he paid them all. I, re- I wonder how he paid them all. I really do. I mean, you know, if you stop and think about it, that's a lot of people to have to share your loot with. Or maybe he told them, whatever you steal, you get to keep, divide it among yourselves. I think he may have had this many people because he needed a way to escape and not be caught. And he was very successful for a long time. It's it's interesting, though, you know, for him to, to go and, and to have so many states in the southern states fear that he was going to start a slave revolt. You know, I mean, he's- I know it that that actually kind of blows my mind a little bit that these people, these the authorities and law enforcement Politicians and highly Politicians, rich families and whatnot. Presidents, yeah. you know, I mean, actually believed that this man could do it. That he could start a slave uh, revolt and revolution, whatever it's called. I can't think of it off the top revolt, of my head. Yeah, slave revolt. And uh, uh, a slave revolt. Well, that and he also wanted to take this over the... man could pull it off. Well, that wasn't just that, but he had enough people backing him up that he was going to take over governments of several different states down there. So they were people were really fearful of this man and, his, and the people... Because nobody really knew how much many people he had working for him well that's true because or working uh, with him it was it was said that he had a network of people up to 2500 now 2500 is a lot of people for that day you know that was probably bigger than congress at the time but uh or any of the us government but they but but to think that this man had that much charisma that much intestinal fortitude about himself that they honestly believed that he could get the job done and they had to do something about it so they started going after the clan members and and it's like you know like we said earlier they they hung them along the river because they knew that john merle traveled a lot along the rivers and they wanted him to see what they, you know, what would happen to him. I wonder how many of those people, though, that they hung, that he actually knew. He probably didn't really care, you know, but I think he also used the river. I think they used the river, too, to transport a lot of their loot up and down to different areas as well. But he had hid his, his, I mean, because they would loot, oh, my gosh, everywhere. So they had tons of money, you know. All over oh, the place, yeah. and they can't. You can't carry up that all on you. So I'm sure that throughout these different states, they have things buried, you know, in different sections. And I'm sure that not everybody remembers where they, you know, put everything. You know. Yeah. I mean, I'm. I mean, when he went to prison, at one point, I mean, his whole clan disbanded. I'm sure. So. I think his. I think the clan disbanded in 1830. Or 1840, sorry. Um, I know that there was a time there when he basically traveled alone. But the clan members, you know, when he encountered them, were still friendly and still helped him out. They just weren't part of his gang anymore. But <clears throat> he um, he was, um, he had been arrested several times. And this was before he really... This, this was before the fake preacher deal. This was before the stealing and reselling of slaves. He was a horse thief. He originally started off as a horse thief? Yeah, he originally started out as a horse thief. When you stole somebody's horse back then, that was like stealing their car today. You know, they well, did not a bit operate more... horse thieves. Some states hung horse thieves. It's probably a little bit more than stealing the car because a horse was used for multiple things, not just transportation, but was used for farming, you know, to help pull. A horse 
back then was a very valuable commodity. It was more valuable than some family. some states and territories. If you were a horse thief, they hung you. They and, shot you and, first and if, before asking questions later. Yeah, and if a say like a rancher caught you stealing his horses, it was absolutely legal for him to hang you from the nearest tree, and a lot of them did. So, no. it, it, he, he, um... So, where was he originally from, then? From Virginia or Tennessee? Because I read... I forgot what he, he said, He was, accor according to the family... Your family He stuff? was buried in... Or, born in Williamson County, Tennessee. So, he's from Tennessee, then? He He's originally from Tennessee. He was raised in Middle Tennessee... There were uh, some things that I read on him, too, when I was researching. It said that he was born in Virginia and raised in Tennessee. But according to the family, he was um, born and raised in Tennessee. And uh, Middle Tennessee was um, south of Franklin. Hmm. Well, hey, why don't, Dover. why don't we take a quick break so you can get a drink of water or whatever. And then I gonna, need one bad. <laughs> yeah, we're going to take a quick three-minute break. So for those of you who are listening over at Ustream, if you scroll down, you can find the link to our website if you want to come over and join in with the chat with some other guys. But we're going to take a three-minute break so people can get up and stretch, get something to drink or eat or whatever, and we'll be right back to finish the rest of the show. Back to anything but ordinary with Spooky and Raven. I'm Raven, and I'm Spooky. You're Spooky, and we're going to continue our discussion on Johnny Merle, which is one of Spooky's direct ancestors, who is basically a really notorious outlaw. A famous, infamous, notorious outlaw. A jerk, <laughs> kind of. Really, he's dirt bag. Yeah, he's stealing, murdering, and. <laughs> What have you, and has, and you know, basically talked everybody from every state to just do his dirty work for him, really. You know, basically, that's what he did. You know, except what he did for himself. He, you know, I mentioned before, got a little gruesome, where, you know, the slaves that he would steal and then resell and steal and resell and everything, 
when finally he couldn't use that slave anymore, he would kill him, cut him open, fill him full of rocks, and dump him in a creek or a river. He did that with people he robbed. So it wasn't just slaves. I mean, you know, like I said, he was considered the most ruthless outlaw of the South. Well, yeah, I mean, it's that's just gruesome. I mean, it seems like he just It's got, very gruesome. It seems and like it he got special, nastier as the years went on. Well, you know what? It takes a special kind of person, <laughs> a special kind of sick person to do that. Jacked up person, for sure. Uh, well, the thing is, is, I mean, huh, why can't he just, I mean, why not just let the slaves go? Why did he have to kill them? That's the part I don't get. You know? I don't get that either, but um, I guess... Well, I mean, because they would eventually got caught by some other slaves. But slaves back then were tortured. They were beaten. Yeah, they were whipped. Yeah. Sooner or later, they were going to beat the information out of the slave. And I think he knew that. But they didn't. But if he was a wise man, he, they wouldn't know that much information. They would just be like, this guy offered me freedom if I just did these couple things to get money up. I'm sure he never brought them back to any certain special place that would trace back to him you know what i mean well that's true you know why not just let them go on up north where where there was freedom uh, uh, you know yeah. i mean that basically that's mm -hmm. all he had to do but for right. some reason you know that was not good enough for him he wanted to get rid completely get rid of any incriminating evidence and the incriminating evidence was the slave or he was just a sick yeah, and he was a sick individual. I mean, if you read the book, Reverend Devil, oh, yeah. you would find out exactly how sick he was. If um, you read some of the things that Mark Twain said about him, you know, I mean, it, Mark Twain encountered him several times. It wasn't just one or two. Mark Twain was well aware of who he was. Uh, there were there have been several books written about him. Some of them now have been a little bit embellished, but <clears throat> for the most part, you know there there are a lot of things in those books that are true. Right, I got the one up that you were going to talk a little bit about the life and adventures of John A. Merle by Augustus Q. Walton. Okay, Augustus Q. Walton. This man is Virgil Stewart. That's his real name. When he wrote this book, he made up this, the name of this author. He even made up an autobiography of Augustus Q. Walton. But his real name is Virgil Stewart. John Merle made the mistake of stealing two slaves from a Reverend John Henning. Virgil Stewart was a good friend of Reverend Henning and so, so to help get the slaves back or to have the person who did it arrested and for some reason I don't know why he knew it was John Merle probably because word got around in the earlier years about Merle what Merle was doing so Virgil Stewart kind of wormed his way into Merle's confidence. And he even found out the name of all the clan, clan members. He took an oath of allegiance and loyalty to John Merle. And then he turned around and set him up to be arrested. Hmm. And all of this happened uh, near Florence, Alabama. He was placed in jail and... The trial took place, it was a two-day trial, and it took place in Jackson, Alabama. And John Merle was found guilty, and he was sentenced to, prison, to hard labor for 10 years. And the charge was slave stealing. Now, this is a man that had murdered. He had stolen horses. He had robbed people. And the only charge they could get him on was slave stealing, which was, at that time, a very serious charge. Right, for the South. Now, The Life and Adventures of John A. Merle by this man, he embellishes his part in Merle's arrest. And a lot of what he says in this book, really, it's exaggerated. 
and I don't want to say it's not all true because there are some true things in that book. But for the most part, he embellishes his role in um, in Merle's capture and arrest and sentence. And he really, I mean, although he had a big part in it, he didn't have the part in it that he claims to have had in that book. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, uh, while Merle was in prison, he learned the blacksmith trade. That was his hard labor. They put him in the blacksmith shop. So when he came out of prison, oh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting tongue tied here. Virgil Stewart, um, because of his arrest, his part in the arrest and the sentencing conviction of John Merle, he received several um, attempts on his life. They weren't just threats. These were actual attempts on his life. And they were so bad that he ended up leaving the southern states for good. And after he left the southern states, that's when he wrote that book. And... um, I guess it was to make money. Oh, The Life and Venture of Johnny Merle. I was just showing the other book, which has uh, one of the scribbling photos of what, you know, he did and what they, he looked like a right. little bit, you know. Because, so, like you said, there's really no photos. There's just sketchings and whatnot. But, right. like you said, there's a lot of people who went out and wrote all these books, but they, they aren't factual 100% of what you um, have learned Ross, from your... Ross... Uh, Fares, P H A R E S. Mm-hmm. He wrote the book. Um, I think it was called Reverend Devil. Yeah, I don't have the, that picture up, but I have a different. And that is one of the more accu- actually more accurate accounts. Uh, there are a lot of things in there that aren't true, but I think that was because that that man didn't know any better. That he just wrote about what he found, and he didn't really check it out a lot. But a lot of what I just told you is in this book. In, in the book Reverend Devil. Right. And, and then if, you learned and, a lot no, of your if, stuff. And if you're interested in finding out about John Merle, that is the book that I would recommend you reading. Well, we'll put it up on our website. What was it called? Reverend Devil. Okay. <laughs> now, the capture of John A. Merle, Natchez, Trace Outlaw, I have that little sign up that you gave me, too. I mean, that's another one that you had shown. That... Uh, is I think it's near Florence, Alabama, <coughs> and they um, they uh, <laughs> they mark the play they they mark the town. I guess it's the town. I'm not sure. I know it's somewhere around um, Florence, uh, yeah. where John Merle was captured. What it says is John A. Merle, known as the Great Western Land Pirate, was captured near this site. In the winter of 1834, he was said to have killed over 400 people, including many kidnapped slaves. His arrest was brought about through the clever maneuvering, maneuvering. of Tom... Br- well, I can't even read that one. So Brandon. Brandon, yes. Yeah, so, well, it's hard to read. A local African-American slave. An attempt had been made by the outlaw to recruit Brandon as a contact man for his far-reaching empire of crime and Brennan was awarded a hundred dollars for his bravery and his name was publicized across the country I would think I would don't give me the money to set me free I'd rather have my hundred dollar a hundred dollars was a lot of money especially to um, a slave well what are you gonna do but with it if you're a slave I forgot, I forgot about Tom Brennan Tom Brennan was one that he did try to recruit and Tom Brennan, for some reason, I guess something told him, don't get mixed up with this man, and he didn't do it. Well, his, his higher power is probably protecting him or something. But, I mean, I would, if, instead of giving him 100 bucks, if you're a slave, what are you going to do with 100 bucks? You can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. I would have had, they should at least gave him his freedom and gave the money to his slave owner, you know, to buy his freedom or something, you know, to let him go. 100 bucks would have paid that man's rent for over a year. He wouldn't have rent if he was a slave. That's true, but um, I was responding to what you said about freeing him, letting him have a home and all that other stuff. Well, not not letting him have a home, just giving him freedom so he could move up north and, you know, 
Because what are you going to do with a hundred bucks when you're a slave? You can't do nothing, you know. And I don't know, maybe he could have used it to buy his freedom from his slave owner. That They should have gave him that for at least, you know, helping them catch Johnny. Well, Murrow. you know what? A hundred dollars would be, well, it depended because the slave, slave owners yeah. had books. Yeah. You know, and uh, they would even list, you know, of livestock. And they would list their slaves in this book of their livestock and the value. And it's sad, but yeah, that's yeah. It's happens. very, very sad. Very sad. It's sickening, but. And a lot of slaves would be put at five hundred dollars, and the reason for that was, if they got a good slave that was a good worker, then they didn't want to lose that one. So they would put a price on them so high that nobody would really want to pay it. They they would go to they could go to the slave auction and buy one for a hundred dollars. Yeah. And it's just it's just a dark dark history, in, in, of our country. Well, part you know, of and it's um, really a shame, but right. I mean, but it's not just them. But I mean, even before that, there were slaves of other I mean, right. Indians, that, Native Americans just, were used as slaves. Some white people were exactly. used as slaves. It's just sickening, you know, <laughs> some of the things that had happened to people throughout history. You know, so well, that's true. That's very true. But unfortunately, that is a part of our history, and it's a part that can't be ignored. Yeah, well, history seems to be losing it just, its... Let, let's just hope it's a part that's never repeated. Oh, but, um, yeah, yep. Ever. There's a Merle little... came out of prison in 1844, and when he came out... Well, he was in prison. Now, you were saying he... I don't know if you said this. He was in prison for 10 years. But while he was in there for 10 years, he was learning the trade to be a black... A blacksmith. Okay. I didn't know when... that they... I didn't even know what kind of prison systems they had set up back then. That's interesting. I really don't know either. Uh, not all part. prisons had something like that. A lot of them, you know, had hard labor. I don't know what kind of hard labor they did. Uh, it makes sense that there would be a blacksmith shop at a prison because, you know, I mean, the horses have got to get shoes. But well, I'm sure they did more than just shoes. They probably helped build the bars. And any yeah, I mean, you know, just else. being a blacksmith doesn't mean that you're shoeing horses. Or shoveling stuff, but yeah. Shoveling stuff, exactly. But you're, you know, they'd be making anything that has to do with the iron and metal and what have you, I'm sure. Right, right. And they needed certain chains, you know, made for prisoners and what have you and whatnot. That, you know, that's interesting that you would say that because some... Uh, some prisons made chains right there in their blacksmith shop. They had prisoners making chains to go on other prisoners. Well, you might as well put them to work. They're there, you know. Gotta That's do something. true. It's not a lot different than how it is nowadays. I mean, they don't really do nothing. They just sit around. So, But the thing is... is and that's still kind of strange, too, because nowadays some prisons make license plates. <laughs> Woo! Shoes for... <laughs> back then it was shoes for the horses. Today it's license plates for the cars. Yeah, well... I'm surprised, you know, so he basically was in prison for how long, did you say? He was in prison for 10 years, and back then you pretty much served your entire sentence. I'm surprised he lived through it. I forget, I forget when the parole system came about. Um, I know that back then uh, some were let out on good behavior, but people like John Merle would go to prison and they would serve their entire sentence. But the sentences back then, while 10 years back then is a lot of time, and he worked in a blacksmith shop, a lot of the sentences, the, the, the amount of the sentence wasn't as harsh. Today, he would probably get 20, 30 years. I heard this, or read this, I didn't hear it, <laughs> but I read this, and it may or may not be true. You can um, conversate after I say it, but I was reading something, and it said Merle was tortured at one time where they branded him with a branding iron and this sh sheriff basically stoked this one branding iron up so hot and, they, and he put it, had his thumb put down on, you know, the, uh, what do you call it, the railing of the judging area or whatever and they yeah. stuck that branding iron on his thumb until smoke raised like about two feet above him and never once did John flinch. And then afterwards he wrapped up his thumb and hand with a handkerchief and they head right back to the cell. There is... I mean, because it burnt it all the way down where it was just cooked and 
icky, you know? Uh, so, yeah, supposedly it was a brand that, that was HT that it stood for horse thief. Because mm -hmm. at one time he was drug into court in his earlier years for horse, for, uh, horse theft. And I think that he only got a fine out of it. I'm not really sure mm -hmm. right off the top of my head. But there is nothing in the family history that says that this certain event is true. Um, the, but isn't there somewhere that they say they have that branded thumb too in a museum or something? The State Museum of Tennessee has a mobile exhibit. And one of the things in the exhibit is a preserved thumb with HT branded into it. And they claim that that's John Merle's thumb. That could have been anybody's thumb, really. That could have been anybody's thumb. And one of the things was that it was a man named Bigelow who knew Merle, who ran with him, that the thumb is his. Oh, so he was actually the one who was branded with the horse theft branding. Right, right. But at some point, you could yeah, just heat up, your th he heat up a knife or some object and burn over the well, lettering. Well, there was, there was nothing that said, even when they buried him, there was nothing said about his thumb missing, or there was even a brand mark in his thumb. Now, uh, and there was nothing when his body was examined that said anything about that. He came out of prison in 1844, and he worked as a blacksmith, and he also became a very religious man. See, the, I heard that he didn't survive all that quick, uh, long after prison, like he had you know, TV he died. Or he died nine months later from pulmonary consumption, which was probably tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And he died in Pikeville, Tennessee, which is in Bledsoe County. He um, was said to be buried in the Smyrna Cemetery, and there's even a headstone there, but he's not buried there. According to family, he is buried in Bethesda, Tennessee, in an unmarked grave. And, uh, you know, when normally at a cemetery, when they bury you, they bury you facing east. John Merle was buried north and south because one of the things that did worry the family was souvenir hunters or somebody would come in and dig him up and steal the body, you know, for whatever reason. There was a story going around that his skull was missing, that someone had, there was a... Um, a reward out for his skull so somebody dug him up and stole his skull that's not true either according to family because when he was buried he was buried in an unmarked grave among other unmarked graves the only difference between him his grave and those others is they were facing west to east his is facing north and south hmm, that's interesting why well, you know for them to think that, but, you know, like you said, well, really he, was he was famous, you know, I mean, that's like the time when, when that guy, uh, somebody stole Lincoln's body. It happens. There are ghoulish people out there. And John Merle was very, very famous in his day. And some outlaws were envied and practically worshipped, you know, from people who didn't know any better. There's people who still worship serial killers and and you know stuff to this day like that so. right and there's always a souvenir hunter you know it says oh look at this you know i got a piece of cloth off of john merle's body you know i mean there there were souvenir hunters even back then having a piece of that probably would have made them feel famous what? i don't know i don't know the mentality mm -hmm. behind that what what year did um he died, Scooby is asking in he chat. Di he died in 1844, nine months after he came out of prison. He came, he came out of prison. He served his sentence. He came out of prison in 1844. He died nine months later. The, the thing is, is they were looting and had gangs in so many different states. And they had such a mass group of people. And they were looting all over the place. I mean, like I said, I was kind of interested. I'm like, I wonder if there's people who are still looking for Merle's personal cash and treasures nowadays. I had, I had heard of a few times uh, as much as 15 years ago when, you know, that there was talk about it. I don't know if anybody is actually looking for it today. 
What? I couldn't tell you all these years that uh, you know ever since ever since he died, you know, every once in a while somebody comes along that's looking for the treasure that he buried. I really doubt if he buried any. I you know, he could have spent it all. That's a lot to spend. And also, you know, he had that many people in his so-called clan. Some of them had to know where the treasure was buried. They probably went and dug it up or, what, you know, got it out of hiding or whatever. Well, not everybody knew everything where he put, but some well, had known or whatever. But I, like I said, I was kind of curious about that, so I was kind of looking up previous before the show, and I, you know, just typed in people searching for John A. Merle's treasure, and then it brought me to different, you know, treasure sites where there are people who, you know, with their... Metal who are talking about and it, yeah. everything and they're out searching and it wasn't well, there's people in tennessee in louisiana um even one somebody was bringing it up on the arkansas state treasure website yeah um texas you know i'm not sure all of the states that he had covered though per se i mean he well, didn't you know weren't you saying that he didn't go as far as arkansas supposedly no he had been to arkansas he didn't I don't think he went as far as Texas. Um, I had a woman contact me one time and asked if uh, she was a uh, direct descendant of John Wesley Harden. And she was telling me of this so-called encounter between John Merle and John Wesley Harden. Now, I know that John Wesley Harden, Frank James, and John Merle were at one time, all three of them together in the same spot. Hmm. But I don't know where it was. I really doubt if he went as far as western Louisiana. He loved New Orleans so much, he that's usually where he ended up when he went into Louisiana. But he was like, um, he did business in like uh, Louisiana, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia. I like when you say business, but yeah. Um, his, he did his thieving. <laughs> yeah, he had to have been in South Carolina because Merle's Inlet is named after him. Well, like, I, and that is along the ocean in um, South Carolina. I don't think it's too far from, um, what's that beach everybody goes to down there? Where? In South Carolina. I can't think of it. It's a popular beach area. But, um, he, let's see. I don't know. I don't even know if he went as far south as um, Florida. Mm-hmm. I know he's, he, he, and Virginia. He, oh, actually, I think he did Virginia get down to Kentucky. Florida. I think I did read something about supposedly. I don't know. We weren't there. But he had gangs as far as down to Florida. He may have never made it that far down, but he had gangs down, up and down. Yeah. In, in several states. But like I said, I came a Myrtle Beach, maybe, Scooby said, that you're maybe thinking of. I'm thinking I'm, that may be it, but I don't. Yeah, Myrtle Beach. Uh, yeah. Yep. Thank you, Scooby. Um, I hope I said Scooby, but yeah, there is, like I said, I was kind of looking around and there's, uh, it's called treasurenet.com, you know, where a bunch of people come looking for, you know, old buried treasure from old, you know, pirates to, you know, Western outlaws to everything else, I'm sure, you know, to civil yeah. war stuff or what have you. And this one guy was looking for the CG or KGC stuff. And then he had happened to run into this trees and carvings with Merle's name on it and stuff. And so he was kind of asking questions or whatever. Now, we didn't get to really read it all or whatever because there was like seven pages to it. But it was kind of a little bit interesting tidbits there or whatever. So if, you know, people are interested, you guys... Well, those people on that site had a interesting chat. And a lot of them came up with some interesting facts. And they were trying to figure out, you know, about these carvings and... Well, they were trying to help assumptions him. and opinions, and they were trying to help each other, exactly. Well, this one guy, he's had... Because um, he, he was trying to figure out, could this possibly be uh, connected to John Merle? Well, that and one then, tree, Merle was clearly carved into that tree. Right, and I dropped but the we, link in chat. I don't think we ever found out, though, where those trees were. Well, he, well, I think he was in Louisiana. Oh, okay. Is what he was talking, because he's from Louisiana or whatever, but they had markings where it had certain marks and stuff, and it had Merle's name in it, but there was other graffiti from 
other generations, you know, newer right. ones, but there was definitely older ones. I think there was even one date on there from 19 or 1720 or something. Yeah. Somebody, but he was asking questions, trying to figure out because, and it, it's kind of in that area of where he could have traveled through. So, I mean, if you guys want to go, we dropped in the link in the chat and I'll put it on the website for anybody who's interested. You can go and kind of read and find out what this guy eventually discovered. And because he <laughs> posted his thing in 2006. So it was a while yeah. back. And he was, when they were started digging around there, they were finding, you know, really old 1800s uh, objects from shovels to like an ax and coins. So I'm not, I didn't, like I said, I, didn't, I just discovered it right before the show. So I wasn't quite sure. So what we he really didn't get with. a chance to read it much. no. Yeah. Just but it might be interesting if somebody wants to go research and look further in to see if there's more, if somebody had discovered some of John Merle's old caches, you know, or if this guy also stumbled on something. It's interesting anyway, you know, for those who are in, into treasure hunting and everything too. Because there's a lot of people who are still looking for things, you know? Right. I mean, like... Right. He seems exactly. to have hid more into caves and and outside in the woods anyway, because he had the biggest collection. Of I things have anyway. I have no doubt that there's something out there somewhere that he has hidden or buried that people haven't you know, come across yet. That people just have not come across yet. It's just the fact that nobody has really found anything that they can connect to him or whatever, you know, as far as treasure and money goes. But that doesn't mean that it's not out there. Um. Like I said before, it's believed by some that he's buried in the Smyrna Cemetery, but, and there's even a headstone there that reads John Merle, but according to some family members, he is actually buried in Bethesda, Tennessee, which is south of Nashville in an unmarked grave. Um, and according to family, his thumb was not branded HT, and the thumb in the state of Tennessee traveling museum is not his that they say that it belonged to another horse thief by the name of Bigelow right and um, according to the story that there was a reward for his skull so the grave so grave robbers dug him up and stole it the family denies that too now I'm not saying for a fact these things did not happen I go by what my grandmother found out and what I found out and through and stories through the family I was at a family reunion one time and this was years ago and an old family member who was in his 90s matter of fact I think he was like 98 I walked up and I, I and I always do this I'll go to the more elderly members of the family when I want to hear stories because they have the best stories and I asked him, you know, I, I asked him, I said, I want to ask you a question. And he said, what? And I said, do you know anything about John Andrews Merle? And he looked me right in the eye and said, you mean the land pirate? He didn't tell me much. He's the one that told me the story about Bessie Merle marrying the outlaw Robert Duvall and about Robert Duvall's bluff. That's where I found that out at. And at the time, we were not very far from Duvall's Bluff. But a lot of what I found out, you know, besides the normal research through the historical societies, and he worked in, he, he did his business in like seven, eight states. And I went through about half of them trying to find out things, and I'm still researching this guy. So it's there there's a lot to it. I mean, he left his mark everywhere he went. Well, like I said with that one link that I was talking about, they were bringing up um veal and you'd mentioned that about the veal. Yeah. TJ Beal. Do you remember what you Oh, said I don't remember. I <laughs> not off the top of my head. Cuz they they were searching the carvings and whatnot and Beal had certain codes and treasures. And th that Bill could actually have been one of John Merle's bandit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I can't confirm that. I really can't. But he could very well, I mean, he was very knowledgeable and stuff. 
he could have very well have been one of one of um because they well, Beale had a, like he was a huge thing too but they were saying that he he had associates that were a part of the mystic clan right magic clan or whatever you call it i mystic sounds better but because you said earlier that people started calling I think it him was that. I think it is actually I kept saying magical but uh it actually is a mystic clan um but to but stumble there, on markings like that that's really old around certain dates Oh and that's a big else. thing that if you know if I'd have came up on that tree with Merle carved in it I would have been ecstatic I would have never have stopped there I would you know I would have researched the area everything that I could have done to find out why that name is there. Right, and I we posted the link in the chat, but I'll put it on the website too. People can just read it and find out if it what if he did what he ended up discovering there or not. But there was markings in there with the letter J, and back in the day, the letter G meant to go in reverse or mirror opposite. You know, yeah. so just giving a hint of turn this way and go so many paces this way, and then start. You'll find the cache. C A C H E, not C A S H. You know what I mean? Catch. <clears throat> yeah, whatever. You know, I find that interesting because, though, if you really think about it, mm -hmm. those carvings in that tree, there was even one of an arrow. But those carvings in that tree, for anybody that knows, if there is a treasure there, they're telling them exactly where it's at. Right. It was a, it's it, it, just deciphering it. Right. It was certain symbols that the, these people would know that was a part of the group. Because the guy was first looking for the KGC clan, which is a totally different clan than what Merle's was. That was, I found what that is finally. KGC stands for Knights of the Golden Circle. And I've heard that term before, and I just cannot remember where I heard that term before. I want to say it has something to do with the Masons, but I'm really not sure. Right, but it's really fascinating what they're posting on this treasuresnet.com having to do with the KGC and John Merle. And the photos, they do have, he, the guy went back several times to get better photos of it, and it's really fascinating. And like we said, we didn't go through the whole seven pages of what they've written, written up, so I don't, I don't know what he actually ended up finding at the, in the end, but he was finding... Some they did find some silver coins. He did find a shovel and a pickaxe. It's you know, and they brought it to somebody a historical type person who knows dating of certain objects or whatever. And they said it was from that same time period where both of you know John Merle and uh, what was the other guy's name that you mentioned that he ran into two other thugs, thugs, thieves. Jesse, did you say? Uh, John Wesley Harden and Frank James. Right. And they were talking about that was around the same time. But some of these carvings and stuff, there's books out there that you can read that these uh, outlaws that used to use and stuff. So this guy ended up ordering one of the books so he could find out what the codes were that they would scribble on caves, trees, and everything else where they would put their treasures and stuff. But it's really fascinating the this guy sharing this. Now, he uh, he's asking questions. He's not stating, saying, this is... You know, Merle did this, but it's it's pretty interesting that it's having similar markings to certain groups of thieves, you know? So, I'm definitely going to check it out later to find out what the other yeah, happened. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check that site out later um, because it, I mean, it is interesting. We didn't get a chance to read much. Because I just it. found it, yeah. Right. And uh, she just, on a whim, because we were talking about, we wondered if anybody ever found any of Merle's treasure. And so she typed that in, and that's what came up. Yeah, there's a few sites that actually came up. This one was from the Louisiana site. They also have one for Tennessee that somebody was talking mm -hmm. about and asking about. And then there was another one in Arizona that was mentioning like $3,000 worth of I don't Cassie, think he made it as it? far as Arizona, and according to what I found, he, you know, if he made it past New Orleans, Louisiana, it was on rare occasions. Uh, he might have crossed over into Texas, but didn't really go very far into it. But I just, I just don't think he made it as far as Arizona. But there are several places, like I said, you know, Merle's Inlet, the Devil's Punch Bowl. 
uh, there are several places where uh, those are the two really actually more famous ones where uh, it is believed that he did bury some of his treasure. And this man made a lot of money at what he did. He had a lot of money. Well, he didn't make he it. He had to he do something it. with it. He didn't make it. He stole it. But Well, he stole it, but it was he still had it. But, you know, according to these people, it was in his possession. the people who really were into researching John A. Merle, like you, and were avid treasure hunters, too, and just really getting into this, they said, you know, one dude had posted as of July 2010, this is what I read, that there had only been two caches, you know, C-A-C-A-G-E-S, linked to the clan that had been unearthed. Only two were discovered. But they roots. were linked to the clan. They weren't exactly linked to Merle. But his... his Because he had, you know, like I said, he had a network of outlaws through seven states. Well, but but technically it's... Technically, it since is. they were part of the clan, you know, they're going to link Merle and to And I'm it. sure he got a certain percentage of almost everything. I'm sure there was a networking oh, I'm sure system. He did. I mean, he was technically the first man to have organized crime before the mobs, mobsters did, I suppose, if you think mm -hmm. about it. But, I mean, if they've only discovered, like, two and out of gosh knows how many they they done, you could only dream of what things could be laying out there. And it's not just them. There's other criminals throughout history that I'm sure people haven't even discovered. There's always people who are looking for that. There are people gold. today that are still looking for the Lost Dutchman Mine in Arizona. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, nobody has found it. Um... There are all kinds of legends out there about lost gold mines that people actually go and look for. They think, thinking that they're going to find wealth beyond their imagination, and they just don't find them. Well, they disappear, don't they, when they were looking for that well, treasure? Well, people who go after the Dutchman's mine that look for it have been known to disappear. Where is that? What state is that again? That's Arizona in the Chiricahua well, Mountains. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, it's desert and dangerous people probably they're not prepared and, for the and arizona was not known for gold for for the discovery of gold you know so um penny says maybe john merle is haunting us for spooky and raven talking about him he ain't haunting me i he, not uh, it. and if there have been there have been reports of his ghost in the devil's at the devil's punch bowl well, how would they know it's his ghost if nobody even knew what he looked like? Well, they're, I guess they're just assuming. You know, they would have to assume. It could have been, it could have been, I'm sure there's probably tons of ghosts going up and down the, the trail of the well, river. Since it's, since well, since they hung so many the people. Thing. Well, that's true. The, the, the thing of it is, if there is a ghost around the Devil's Punch Bowl, where according to some people... He buried treasure there. They're going to naturally assume that it's Merle's ghost. And to them, that's proof that there is hidden treasure there. There, it, that, that could be anything. You know, I mean, it doesn't necessarily... There's no way to prove that it's even his ghost. And I wouldn't want to go to the Devil's Punch Bowl because of the snakes and crap up on that <gasps> hill. No, no cussing. Snakes uh, and in the 1840s... There is a district of Atlanta, Georgia, that was so lawless. Even the cops would not go in there. It was just a place where Were they murders, robberies, muggings, all kinds of things. This was the 1840s. They so the they started calling that Merle's Row after John Merle. In the 1840s, John Merle's history and legend was still very much alive. Um, like I said before, in Mark Twain's novel, Tom Sawyer, he's mentioned, um, where Tom and Huckleberry Finn see Injun Joe finding Merle's treasure, and after Injun Joe's death by starvation, Tom and Huck find the treasure again. That's in, um, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. And also he's mentioned in Mark Twain's autobiography, Life on the Mississippi River. Well, I'm sure he's mentioned in a lot of different things. He is. That's that's what I'm doing now is um, the Tennessee Historical Society has a traveling exhibit which features, among other things, a preserved thumb that 
supposedly belongs to Merle, and they are claiming that it did. Well, yeah, which we According just According to other about. sources, that thumb belongs to someone else. Right, which you just talked about, yep. All right, a man named Bigelow. On NBC in um, October of 1959, on episode 5 of Riverboat, it was a popular TV show back then. Uh, he was fictionalized as a riverboat pilot who planned to hijack another riverboat. So now he's gone from books. His legend has gone from stories to books to television. And in 1958, on episode 20, back then they had longer episodes than they do now, uh, in season two of The Adventures of Jim Bowie. And I'm sure if you know anything at all about history, you know who Jim Bowie is. Um, the name of it was called Pirate on Horseback, and what it was, Jim Bowie pretended to be a criminal to gain Merle's trust. And in that episode, Merle was portrayed as the leader of the Brotherhood that planned to overthrow the U.S. government, and he received his guidance from God. Sorry about that. What was that? My phone, you know that. <laughs> it always makes that. Doo -doo. Made me jump. Sorry about that. Um, Eudora Welty short story, A Still Moment, uh, John Merle is fictionalized as the murderer James Merle. And that's kind of funny because there was actually, he had a brother named James Merle, and he was one of the few in the family that wasn't a petty thief. Um, in the 1940 film Virginia City, he is, por he is portrayed as a, ban uh, a bandit named John Merle. Mm -hmm. uh, the story takes place at the end of the Civil War, which is more than. 20 years after his death and the man who portrayed John Merle was Humphrey Bogart yeah I've, there was another recent movie out that he was mentioned in where Jamie Foxx had played one of the top slaves or whatever and John A. Merle is also mentioned in during that time period as well because I think they were trying to depict how awful slavery really was which it, we all know it was which it was and we're not denying that we, we and we think it we're totally against it too and it's horrible but you know um i just and i forgot the name of the movie but you can look up jamie fox when it comes to that and it should pop up with john amor just type in jamie fox and john amor i cannot think of the name of the movie but it wasn't that you know not that too long ago you know so but it's, a, it's and, he's um, mentioned in a lot of things in a 1976 novel by Gary Jennings, he's, um, it's a, a fictionalized account of the pursuit of Merle by Virgil Stewart, but it's told from Stewart's point of view. And I cannot think of the name of that movie, or book. So, his legend actually lived a long time and there are still people who research him mm -hmm. there's still people looking for their that loot of merle's millions that supposedly still could be out there you know because he, after like you said after so the seeds of hemp that's the name of that book sorry <laughs> it just popped into my head Right. Well, like I said, there's still people looking out there for the treasures in different sections because they're finding odd markings and whatnot. And I'm sure there is some things out there. And, you know, there's a lot of false information and there, there is a lot of truthful information out there, you know. Right. But, um, well, you know, it's that way anyway with any, a any um, historical figure. And he is a historical figure. Not a good one. But he is a, a historical right. Figure. But you just kind of wanted to do this because you had stumbled on the fact that you had found that this man was. You know what really this. made me want to do this? I was I was a kid at the time, but when I got older, I was able to do it. What really made me want to do this was the fact that my dad's mother just stopped. She was. She found out something in her family that she didn't like, so she just stopped. 
And then you and of course here. when she did that, then my curiosity took over. Yep, curiosity killed the cat, or satisfaction brought it back. So, and then mm. you decided, well, you know what? She's so against it. I got to figure out what the heck she's so against. And then it just drug you deeper into finding these different things, and then finding out. And the thing of it is, you got how to how messed any, up this man was. Yeah, any time when you research anybody, even family members. You know, you got to kind of dig through what's fictional, what's non-fictional, you know. And if you can, and if you happen to find elderly family members, they usually know the stories. Right. And <clears throat> if that is, if they will talk. I um, met a woman that was on, uh, a descendant of Bessie Merle. And when I was asking her questions, she'd sit there and go, shh, shh. The walls have ears. The walls have ears. I, that's all she would say. She wouldn't say anything about anything. You know what? These people are long dead. What's it going to hurt to talk about them? People, you know, people in the family want to know. Well, maybe she don't want any trouble coming down to her, meaning the walls have ears. They don't want other people knowing and and then them being responsible for things or whatever. I'm but, sure that everybody has their own different reasons. I, their I'm, own I'm sure. I, I'm sure. Or maybe she, she meant the walls have ears. Could have been spiritual. Maybe there's ghosties tuning in. Could have been. You know, I'm sure she had her reasons. But it's like I said. You know, these these people are long dead. Right. Long dead. And what you know, and I cannot see what it would hurt to talk about them. Now, I know that some members of the family don't want to because they're embarrassed, but you know what? That entire family, with the exception of Leanna, who, by the way, was um, a dance, or not, not uh, Leanna, uh, Judette, who was, in her day, a very accomplished dancer. But... Not it, a saloon dancer. Not a saloon dancer. She was, she was a, um, I don't want to say she was very famous, but she was well respected and very accomplished for her time. But, and I can see where maybe they would be embarrassed, but they got to stop and think. There's criminals all through that family. Right. You well, know, and, I mean, mm -hmm. go ahead. You know, visiting day at the local prisons like a family reunion. Right. And like we said, well, like you, so you want, you know, the reason why we did this thing tonight, because, you know, we like to talk about anything and everything. We have multiple conversations about everything. So our shows aren't always going to be on paranormal. It's not always going to be, you know, ghosts and spirits and what ha monsters or what have you or whatever. But we like to talk about Western things. We like to talk about mobster stuff. We like to talk about you know, JFK, well, conspiracy monsters. theories, aliens, whatever comes to our mind that, you know, we talk about. But this one was kind of interesting because you were telling me a little bit about it and it's, you know, being a relative in your lineage or whatever, uh, you know, and we'd like to talk about Western stuff and other things. I thought, you know. We Western Western history and mob history are two of my favorite yeah, things. Yeah, conversations you know, we've I, I love history. Them. That I really excelled in history at school, U.S. history. And um, I, uh, for some reason, the Old West and mobsters just fascinated me. And it's not because they led glamorous lifestyles, which they may... To some people, it was. To some people, yeah. but they weren't glamorous lifestyles. You know, what kind of a life did really did he have being on the run most of his life? But if you think about it, you didn't really have much to do back then but be a farmer or hopefully work somewhere in town but what's there to do in towns back then so most people you know probably thought it was glamorous not that we're saying it is but to, to travel and to see the the country Plus he had money all the time to see the know? country and have all the you know and maybe he got five bucks would buy you a week of pleasures back then well i don't want to know what their pleasures and were then some, but but i'm sure he got his rocks off being able to manipulate people <laughs> and you know and and to see what he how far how far he could really take it you know but right. at some point he you know and he at went some nuts. point I'm sure it was a game to him yeah you know? but then he went then he got too crazy and too ego or too something because when he's out killing people he didn't even have to kill it's just 
somewhere he well, lost guess, everything. Guess that it, it, it's it, it's really kind of funny to me. On his deathbed, he admitted that all the crimes that he was accused of or people thought he did, he said that he committed them except murder. He would not admit to to committing murder. And he committed, uh, to some figures, say, 400 murders. Well, you, nobody really knows because you don't know what the dude's doing you know, if you don't, there's not somebody with him or whatever, or, you know, who knows how many children he had out there, you know, with numerous women that he probably encountered on the road. But at some point, his father had to try to instill into him morals and God and the Bible because he knew some of it. So he had some teaching. And then when the dad moved on to go be traveling and whatnot, he probably just didn't get along yeah, but, with his wife but the and thing didn't of want it to be is, a dad. So he- he he knew his dad was a preacher, you know. He, I mean, I'm sure that he has had some teachings. That in he it. had some religious but once, education, but, even if it was from his dad. He, and but he saw this as a scam. But here's to my, him, it was a scam. Got, it was a way to make money. Yeah, but here's my theory: was it going to go with? And I know you got your idea and had to get it out, and that's how we work. It's totally cool. That's how we talk. But I was just thinking. I'm not saying it's factual, but at some point, let's his dad's there with the mom, and they have a couple kids, right? Well, all of a sudden, the dad has to become a traveling preacher. It almost seems like they might have not got along, and maybe their marriage wasn't as what he, they thought it was going to be, because obviously she had to have that personality in, in her before she met him. And maybe she right. got married to him in order to get that in given to her by her father before he passed or whatever. And then this guy's like, I'm done with him. I'm just going to travel preaching and probably didn't want to come back and deal with her that much. And then, then she goes into the business of well, he selling couldn't change and her. Yeah, he couldn't change her. You know, he he would come home and he would um, see what this inn has become, and he would beg her to change her ways. Right, and but he, why would he couldn't she change her? But being a preacher, and back then, you did not divorce your wife. But do you think and he, seeing that kind of as a child being exposed to that type of behaviors? And seeing all these different type of criminals and who knows what kind of right. attachments or whatever could have been attached to these people and the things that he learned that could have altered him, his personality. And, and you know, he may have become dark after that. And then I, I don't think it was so much attachments. I think it was the way he grew up because all he grew up around were thieves and murderers and, and whoremongers and, you know, people like that. He very he he didn't really. Even though his dad was a Methodist preacher, he didn't really have a father influence in his life. Well, but and, and for uh, what I found out, he he had no respect for his father and didn't even like him. I'm sure he didn't have respect for his mother either, because you know he's basically taught that women are nothing but objects, you know, and people are are nothing but. And she taught her kids to steal. Yeah, and she basically taught told people, you know, taught them that, you know, you do what you gotta do or whatever, but. Hey, why don't we um, tell people what we're going to do next week? Okay. Uh, Before I do that, I was going to mention there are also books written about him. Like I said, Mark Twain, Life on the Mississippi, and The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Uh, Reverend Devil by Ross Fares, P-H-A-R-E-S. And then you got the The Life and Adventures of John A. Murrow by Augustus Q. Walton, which I don't recommend that book at all. Um, then why did you have me post it on the web page? <laughs> well, well, the reason was because Augustus Q. Walton is not that man's real name. That is Virgil Stewart, the man that actually did have a part in setting Merle up to be arrested. Oh, and gotcha. like I said, there are a lot of things in the, There are some things in that book that are true, but he embellishes his part. And don't get me wrong, he did have a major part, but it's not as great as he let tells it to be so but it's it's a supposedly first-hand account yep Mm -hmm. uh reverend devil wasn't written until the 1940s i think it was and he and uh fairs researched it right but he didn't research too deep but there are, are a lot of facts in that book right well i want to thank everybody for coming and join us next week august 29th 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern, when we will discuss monsters, specifically werewolves. Beast of Javad in France, 
the Hellhound of West Virginia, the Grafton Monster of Grafton, West Virginia, and the Beast of Bray Road in Wisconsin. Monsters, are they real? Thank you, everybody, for coming in. I want to thank Raven for the great questions that she asked me. I want to thank our mods, and I hope everybody has a great week. Right. I want to thank everybody for popping in and, and listening to us. And like we said, we're always going to have a wide variety of different shows, so we'll never know what we're going to do. But if you have any ideas or suggestions, you can go on our website and uh, shoot us an email or whatever and give us ideas and things to check out. And share us on Facebook. Yeah, and totally share us. Thanks, Facebook. Thanks, everybody. Good night.